In the spring of 1980, on a typical Friday night in Madisonville, Louisiana, a 16-year-old Debbie Morris and her boyfriend were on a date and did what they often did, that was get a couple of milkshakes and go down to the river and park in his car. That evening took a bad turn when two armed men hijacked the car and Robert Willie got into the driver's seat while Joseph Ficaro got into the back seat and put a gun to Debbie's head. They drove out of town, which would begin a 30-hour journey through a living hell. After driving for just 15 minutes, they pistol-whipped the boyfriend and put him into the boot of the car. They told Debbie to take off her clothes in the back seat. She recalls the horror of just thinking about what they were about to do to her, how disgusting these men were, and how close they were about to become any second. After raping Debbie, they headed east, away from home, away from hope. As they neared Moville, Alabama, they stopped, took the boyfriend out of the car and put Debbie into the boot of the car. They told her they were going to release him and then a little further down the road would release her. She prayed from within that car for them to be keeping their word. She heard two gunshots ring out through the woods followed by the sound of boys returning to the car, cackling with elated laughter. When they removed Debbie from the boot of the car, she inquired as to the gunshots she'd heard, and they told her that they'd fired them in the air to scare her boyfriend off into the darkness. Debbie later found out that they had hung her boyfriend in a tree and stabbed him in the side. They had cut his throat, burned him with cigarettes, shot him in the back of the head twice at close range. They continued on towards Florida, realizing they didn't have a drug connection in Florida, they decided we'll turn around and head back to Louisiana. At a certain point, they turned down a secluded road to a place called Freaky's Cave. On the way, it was just before dawn, there was a man they passed by with a bucket and fishing rod, presumably out for the dawn catch. These boys probably had in mind to kill Debbie in Freaky's Cave, as they had done to another 18-year-old girl previously. But possibly the fear of being heard caused them to abort that murderous plan. They raped Debbie once again and moved on with her alive. They headed to a local drug dealer's caravan where again Debbie was raped and then tied up so her perpetrators could rest. In the early hours of Sunday morning, drug dealer Tommy Holden sobered up enough to realize Debbie was an underage girl being held against her will and demanded she be taken home. A debate ensued between the boys about what they should do, whether we should kill her or not. Miraculously, finally, they drove Debbie home and released her, even remarking that they were doing something foolish. Debbie Morris would come to learn some very valuable lessons about the nature of forgiveness. Talking about the execution of the main perpetrator, Robert Willie, Debbie shares some insights and experience in the following video. When you've been hurt that deeply, how can you possibly forgive? 
you have to understand this was a man that I had feared since the first moment I laid eyes on him. How much time had, had gone by from that first moment till the execution? Four and a half years. Four and a half four and years. A half year. And wow. for four and a half years, he was the first thing that I thought of when I woke up, the last thing that I thought of before I went mm -hmm. to sleep. I, I would say, please don't let him be standing here if I wake up in the middle of the night. I was so terrified of him. I'm sure. So, so there was this great sense of relief that, that I was hoping to feel when he was finally gone and I thought that that, would, that part of my life would be over and I wouldn't have to fear anymore. But at the same time, the closer the execution got, the more anxiety I felt about mm. it. You wake up the next morning, Debbie. What hit you when you saw that headline announced confirming the reality? I just was numb. It, like I said, it's hard to describe. Did it, uh, did it bring the closure you were anticipating? No. Oh. No, and that would become even more evident in the days, the weeks, the months after. What happens to a person to move you to that closure? Something must have happened. You've had closure. Right, right. What's uh, happened? What happened along the way? It, it was when I just turned back to God and sort of threw my arms up in the air and said, what's going to make this better and and how can you help me now I'm, I give up I'm willing I'm willing to let you do it this is just so much bigger than me experientially what happens when a person forgives the, the whole process of forgiveness mm -hmm. happens in steps it's not an event a lot of people think that it's an event and once they say I want to forgive, I do forgive, that help me to over. forgive, that that's it. The pain goes away, everything's okay. That's not what happens. At the time, I was sort of thinking that maybe that's what would happen. But I didn't even understand hmm. forgiveness at the time. What I wanted at that point was for the hate to go away, mm -hmm. for this, I felt like I was the one who had been imprisoned for four and a half years. Robert Lee Willie may have been behind bars, but I felt like I had been in prison. I wanted that gone. I wanted to, to quit being controlled by the past, and I wanted to all of a sudden experience a freedom that would help me be able to move into the future. Mm. That's what I wanted. I wanted it all at once that night. It didn't necessarily happen like that, but it was a step. I did feel the freedom that came with that initial uh, step in forgiveness. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, that really got my attention was when uh, it says in the Bible that, that we will be forgiven as we are willing to forgive mm -hmm. others. And when I took a look at my life and over the four and a half years during uh, after my kidnapping and before Robert Will Willie's execution and even some time after that, I had really made a mess of my life, mm. and I needed to be forgiven by God. Mm. I needed to be forgiven by God mostly for turning my back on him for four and a half years and blaming him for what happened to me. What brought Demi closure was not the execution of her attacker, but when she turned back to God, threw her arms up in the air and in her words says, what's going to make this better? How can you help me now, God? I give up. I'm willing to let you do it. This is so much bigger than me. Do you think we can learn from her? I learn a lot when I look at her. I learned that no human outcome and no outcome without forgiveness will bring closure. This was humanly over. It had been over for years, humanly, if not days. Debbie had been returned to safety. The boys had driven her home and released her against their good judgment, according to their statement. Time had passed. She was cleaned, she had a shower, those clothes that she had on, I imagine, were burned or in the bin. Any scars, any bruises on her body would have well healed. The perpetrators had been caught, 
in the hands of the authorities. They were tried. They were convicted, sentenced, and now killed. And yet Debbie cries out to God and says, what's going to make this better? The implication there, of course, is none of those outcomes made it better. Right? Friends, you've been hurt. I know, because I've been hurt. You've been wronged. I've been wronged. And we've wronged. All of us. But until we know the forgiveness of God and are willing to extend the forgiveness to one another, nothing's going to make anything better. That's a hard journey, a long journey, or it could be a hard journey and a short journey. It's a hard journey. We've got to get there, though, if we want to be free. We will not be free without forgiveness. If we're going to reflect the kingdom of God that has come in Christ and is coming by the Holy Spirit through His bride, the church, us, the foundation of God's kingdom is love. And the hallmark of His love is forgiveness. Likewise, that glorious mortar that binds us together as living stones in this dwelling place of God, the church, that's love. And the hallmark of that is forgiveness. I would argue that God's forgiveness of us and our forgiveness of one another are two essential traits of the kingdom of God. I think I'd be supported well in that argument. We're wrapping up a sermon series on forgiveness, but by no means are we wrapping up the cycle of forgiveness. It goes on and on till his kingdom comes in glory. And then us, we who are forgiven, will be in it forever and ever. It's a lifetime of discipline and pain that we all must undertake. But it brings freedom. It's the only freedom we can taste. How does it work? And furthermore, why do it? Why pursue forgiveness? In Paul's letter to the Ephesians, in chapter 4, he urges the church to walk worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So as Christians, Paul says, we should walk worthy of the calling we've received. This could apply to a myriad of things in life, if we unpack it and apply it. But basically, to walk is often a term used in the New Testament that talks about daily routine. That's your walk. Daily routine. And worthy here speaks not of performance, like we somehow uh, deserve forgiveness, we earn our salvation. No, that's not what worthy is. Rather, this means to be in a position... Uh, that would match our position with Christ. We want to live in a way that would match our position with Christ. And what is our position with Christ if it's not dearly loved and forgiven sinners? We should, therefore, Paul says, he goes on to say, bear with one another, be humble, be patient, be gentle, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And the bond of peace in the kingdom of God is love. And a hallmark of that love is forgiveness. Colossians 3.14 says, Above all, 
put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. So why pursue forgiveness? Because it is just worthy of the calling we've received in Christ as forgiven. What if we don't like it though? What if like, we just don't want to do that? It sucks. Well, tough tea bags, baby. You have to do it. We must walk as Christians in a way that matches our position with Christ. That's his command, not mine. And it is tough. We've all got pain. So the best thing we can do to do that is to meditate on our position with Christ daily. We want to meditate on our position with Christ and not meditate on our position in the courts. It doesn't help us to have people around us that want to vindicate us in our vindictive pursuits setting us as righteous against our perpetrators who have wronged us. It doesn't, it's not helpful counsel. If you've got friends doing that, do what you've got to do to stop it. Either they stop it or you leave. Not that there's anything intrinsically wrong with courts, but we're talking about forgiveness in the Christian life here. We're not courts serve a purpose. Christian forgiveness far supersedes the judgment of any people in court or on the playground or in the workplace or on the TV or social media. Sometimes we need both courts and forgiveness, but we always need one, a cycle of forgiveness. I told you the story of Debbie Morris this morning, hoping you'll be triggered yeah, the world wants to warn you about triggers and, and protect you from triggers. Not me. I preach the word of God and I pray that you'll be triggered every time we open it. If you want to trigger warning, watch out if you come to church and open the word of God or in your own time because it should trigger you. It has more power than you can imagine. More than anything. I want us to be triggered into action. Having said that, if anyone's here having a hard time this morning, which I imagine many are, because this life is hard, and a lot's gone on, if you're having a hard time processing hurt, and even hate, pursuing forgiveness and wondering how you could ever possibly get to the point of it. I'm glad you're here. This is a good place to be. And we are people who will walk with you in that. Come and see me privately, see me through the week, um, whatever you like. But I want to walk with you out of that cell that you're in and into the freedom that forgiveness will bring. That's what my calling as your pastor is. And that's what our calling as the church is. To just help each other do that. I don't know your pain. But God does. He can bring healing through forgiveness. He really can. We have clues in this chapter of Ephesians how that might look or happen. It's no surprise it begins cognitively to me with mind set, with the process of thinking. Look at Ephesians uh, oh, verse 17. Therefore, I say this and testify in the Lord, you should no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thoughts. They're darkened in their understanding. They're excluded from the life of God because of their ignorance. 
that is in them because of the hardness of their hearts. See in this chapter how Paul is contrasting two different approaches, two different walks, two different daily routines. Walk worthy of the calling you have in Christ and don't walk like the Gentiles do. And in this instance, he's referring to Gentiles as unbelievers. Now, whether that's current unbelievers outside the church, possibly, I imagine, in here this morning, but unbelievers is in not believers, or whether that's unbelievers in who we all were before Christ. We were all unbelievers. Don't either walk like they do or don't walk like you used to do. Walk differently now. He describes that contrast with the cognitive elements of futility of thought, darkened understanding and ignorance. Don't do that. Look how this cognitive position affects verse 19. They became callous and gave themselves over to promiscuity for the practice of every kind of impurity with a desire for more and more. That's an environment of unforgiveness amongst many other things. We could go a lot of places with that verse. But look at the word callous. Callous was a word used to describe a certain marble, a really hard marble. In a medical term, it would be a callous between the bone. If applied to the eye, it would it would impair to the point of blindness. So don't be hard-hearted and don't be blind, basically, is what we're hearing here. Instead, Paul uses three more cognitive terms in the next verses to address the church. Verse 20. That is not how you came to know Christ. Assuming you heard about him. And we taught and were taught by him. As the truth is in Jesus. Take off your former life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And to put on the new self, the one created according to the likeness in righteousness and purity of the truth. Salvation involves the mind, friends, very much so. So does our faith walk. It involves the mind. We do often emphasize this element of uh, faith in the Christian you know, experience. And sometimes we arrive at a misnomer that you've just got to kind of switch your mind off, have faith and take a leap. That's not true. You can't do that and survive. The mind is the center of thought, of understanding, as well as motive and action. I mean, we use our minds. We know that that's true. One of the things that God gives a Christian is a mind of Christ, a new mind. It's what happens when the Holy Spirit lives in us. It comes with a new spiritual and moral capacity, a capability that a mind that's apart from Christ doesn't have. It's a new mind, God-given. That is not to say Christians' minds can't descend to absolute depraved darkness. We've all been there. We've all behaved a lot worse than people that don't know Christ. We've done that way too often. But we can, in Christ, have a renewed mind. Indeed, we are to put off the old self, Paul says, and put on the new self. There's action there. We've got a job to do. We're getting dressed. It's a renovation of the mind and it involves us with some actions. Meditating on God's word. That's good. Meditate on things above, on things ahead, the hope that we have in Christ. 
through prayer and worship. In Romans, Paul tells us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And in 2 Corinthians, Paul tells us to take thoughts captive to obey Christ. We have to, with our minds, walk in a manner worthy of the calling we have in Christ. Can you see our role in forgiveness? It's a continual, it's a command, actually, that involves a journey. It involves us putting off the old self and putting on the new self in Christ, albeit with God's help. What Debbie Morris would learn was that this whole process of forgiveness doesn't happen in an evening or an instant. It's not an event. It's a journey. It's a lifestyle. It's a walk, actually. She found out that when she said she wanted to forgive or, yes, I forgive you, uh, the pain didn't stop necessarily but rather she began to move away from the pain through that journey, through being a disciple of Christ on that journey. She's a growing people. She'd fit in here, wouldn't she? At the end of Ephesians 4, Paul gives us a picture of what it looks like to take off the old and put on the new. Verse 31 Let all bitterness, anger and wrath, shouting and slander be removed from you along with all malice and be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another just as God also forgave you in Christ. These verses summarize what it looks like. It looks less like we used to look Before we believed, and as we go, we look more like Christ as we take off the old and put on the new. That's how it looks. We put away or remove bitterness. That is a festering resentment. We put it away. We put away anger. That's like an internal deep hostility. Wrath. That has to do with rage as as a reaction to a moment. My weakness, if you're taking notes and interested. My biggest challenge in all these. Wrath. Shouting. That's a heart out of control. Did I say wrath was my biggest weakness? (laughs) I don't know. Depends who the Bulldogs are playing or... Or who left that like that? (laughs) Slander. That's evil speaking. And malice is a general Greek term for evil. We take that off. That's not who we are. If it comes on unexpectedly, we look in the mirror and we take it off. We put on Christ. It looks like verse 32, kindness and compassion, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. And there it is. There it is. Just like he forgave you. That's all the reason we need. God forgave us in Christ. The very position of his being in Christ is forgiveness. That's that one we want to walk worthy of. We enter into a restored relationship with God because of his forgiveness of us. And we access that forgiveness through week two, if you remember, confession and repentance. So now, as Christians... What if we don't have, like, what if someone 
doesn't confess, because we enter forgiveness through confession, well, what if they don't confess? Does that mean we don't have to forgive? I hope not. Because if you remember, we're the ones free when we forgive. So if it's up to their confession, we're in a bad situation. Of course it's not. The Bible talks about two manifestations of forgiveness. We will call them, because this is what we call them in our discipleship studies around here, heart forgiveness and expressed forgiveness. Our people have just studied this not long ago. Heart forgiveness is what we do because God forgave us. That's heart forgiveness. That's why we forgive others in our heart. They don't need to even know about it. Lest repent, confess, admit. We just forgive them in our heart. In fact, we can't worship God if we're not willing to do that. It's described in Mark 11.25. It says, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven will also forgive you in your wrongdoing. So that, that's a scary little connection, isn't it? This stage of heart forgiveness is an unconditional willingness by us to forgive those who have wronged us. It's unconditional. This is the reason that a woman who had her boyfriend murdered brutally, was raped for 30 hours, terrorized, kidnapped, is the one who herself had to repent. Can you get that? All that happens to her and she's the one that has to repent. That's the reason. Heart forgiveness. She didn't have it. She needed to understand. She came to God and repented. Heart forgiveness is enough to let the captive go. And the captive is us. If we're not forgiving someone, bad luck. That's us. We've bound ourselves. Heart forgiveness was the only stage available to Debbie Morris. That's all she had. Heart forgiveness. And it was enough. She's free. Free as a bird in Christ. You can see it in her eyes, can't you? She's radiant in Christ. You see, her perpetrators were dead. They couldn't. Probably wouldn't ever confess or repent. But that had nothing to do with it. Maybe that's as far as we get in this cycle of forgiveness. But that's far enough. But we must get there. If we don't get there, we're not going to be free ever. And then there's all that other stuff about how God's going to approach us. There's no hope for healing. But only the expectation of bitterness, anger, wrath, slander, malice. Because we're not putting that away. We can't. But when our perpetrator comes to us and they're repentant, well, we enter the next stage. That's called expressed forgiveness. We can see a diagram here. Thanks, Sam. God forgave us That's why we forgive. An unrepentant offender gets heart forgiveness. Every situation gets heart forgiveness. But if they repent, they come back and give expressed... We give expressed forgiveness just because God also forgave us in Christ. That's why. How does God express forgiveness to us on the condition of repentance? God doesn't express forgiveness without repentance, though he always has it in his heart. This is how God works with us. 
It's how we must work with one another. God doesn't call us to anything he's not willing to model, including the cross. You see, God's not bitter. God's not angry. God's not slanderous. Even though we are his enemy and have wronged him more than we can count. 2 Peter 3.9 says, He's not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. You see the evil in the world? God loves those people. He wants them to come to repentance. He's forgiven them in his heart. But he can't express that until they enter into it through confession and repentance. His heart is full of it, forgiveness. And he expresses it in accordance with our repentance. That is why. That's the way that the relationship between us and God has been restored. And it's the only hope of any relationship between us and us, one another, being restored. Genuinely. So much more to say. But a lot more to do, right? <laughs> We've all got homework. We've all got ongoing assignments. It's a journey. It's a journey of grace. We're in it together. And that's half the subject. <laughs> So let's do it in accordance with God's grace.